Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. We're coming to the end of the book of Romans. We've been on a long journey learning about sin and salvation and security and sanctification and God's sovereignty and the spiritual gifts that we have and how to serve one another. But now he's at the summation of his life. And he kind of dips back into his own life. And the he I'm referring to is Paul, the apostle. Now, Paul, the apostle, was handpicked by God at that particular time as he was doing a lot of other handpicking of people, but particularly to reach out to a Gentile group of people. Now, those of you that are new in understanding of the Bible, there are primarily just three groups of people, not men and women, sin or otherwise. These are people that are known as Jewish people. That is their heritage. That's who they are. They're Jews. Then you have what are Gentiles, and that would be everyone else, whether they're Arabs or whether they're people who live in America, doesn't really matter. Anybody who is a non-Jew would be known as a Gentile. The third group is even more unique, and that would be the, the group known as Christians. Now, Christians are made up of Jewish people who trusted in their Messiah Christ, like you've trusted in Christ, and Gentile people who have placed their faith in Christ. Now, those two groups, God makes one out of them, and they become a Christian. And that's how he's pulling this all together. So Paul was certainly being the chief Jew at the time in his own mind. And he was ranked that way. He said that in Philippians. He really was then called by God to go to the Gentiles to explain to the Gentiles the importance of Jewish people. But also importance of Jesus Christ who was a Jew, the Messiah, who could be their savior as well. Taking the message globally. And that's who he is that we're going to learn about today. This would be an autobiography. Now, I have biographies in my, 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 my room upstairs, my study. One biography is seven volumes long on Hudson Taylor alone, and then I have multiple volumes on him. Some are as short as only four or five pages. And so I want you to know this is not a long autobiography on the Apostle Paul, but it does allow us to read into his little journal, his diary, as he's writing these things down, with the intention of sending that diary as a letter to a group of Christians like you and me in Honolulu, but there in Rome, not the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church was nowhere there or even on the horizon at that time. It was to a group of Christians in Rome at the church at Rome. So he's now writing to them, and if you go through this passage of Scripture, it's pretty easy to see that he is giving us hints into how do we serve the Lord God's way. Now, why is that relevant for you and me? Because I believe that in this group, there's enough people that are hearing me that says, I really want to serve the Lord His way. But I don't know how to do that yet. And so I want to learn how to do that. And so I'm hoping that today's message might impact you, or maybe you'd say impact me, so that we could serve the Lord God's way. Now when you hear that, I don't want you necessarily to think that you only serve the Lord God's way when you become a a missionary to the foot-washing aborigines in some little island somewhere or you're a pastor, or that you have to give up secular jobs, if I can use that very general term. No, it's just you deciding to live your life, to touch another life, and as many as you can, with your life for the glory of God. So for you, if you're single, it'd be all the people that are around you, all the people you connect with. For those of you that are married, it could be your mate, it could be your family, it could be the people you work with, it could be your neighbors, it could be your associates if you serve in a committee or a team or whatever else you're doing. It's just you deciding that I'm living my life to impact others for the Lord. Now, if I'm going to do that, I want to model honesty, decency, and integrity. I want to let them know I'm not ashamed of Christ. It means that I want to minister grace or kindly to them. I not want to point my bony finger at wrath and tell them they better turn or burn or try or fry or forsake or bake. I don't want to do that. I want to come alongside them and love them right where they are. But I'm strong enough to let them know that I just don't want to make earth a better place for them to go to hell from. That I also want to make sure they understand the simplicity of the simple plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. So somewhere along the line and early in the process, I want to make sure they understand that. So whatever you are, whoever you are, wherever you go in your life, I would hope that you would have respect enough for the Lord and his love for people, even though we don't all know everything about the Lord, but enough that he's worthy to be trusted. He's worthy to be surrendered to. I know that's not good grammar, but you know what I mean. But he's also worthy to be proclaimed. And that we might enter into the joy of doing that for him. And so Paul is going to speak to that issue. 
And so if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them up. You'll see the verses on the screen for the most part. And then uh, others might uh, have it in your little outline that I provided for you. But we're going to turn to Romans, if you will, Romans chapter 15. And the title of our of our session this week and next week will be on serving the Lord God's way, not Stan's way, not a denomination's way, but we just want to learn from God and what does he say in the book, the Bible, the greatest book ever written, God's mind and voice on paper for us. So what does he really tell us to do? So if you will, I want to just kind of dip back. I know it says verse 15, but you've got to kind of get the flow. The paragraph actually begins in Romans 15, verse 14. Let me read it to you. Paul is now coming to the close of his letter to the Romans, and he says this, And concerning you, my brethren, which means you're my brothers and sisters in Christ, whether you're a Jew or Gentile, you're a Christian, you became my brother. He says, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and are able to admonish one another. I taught you that a couple of weeks ago. Basically, that's nothing more than a general compliment, a genuine general compliment to those people. Now, he could have stopped there, and most of us do that when we're working with people. We like to load them up with compliments. We taught you the difference between a compliment and a flat and flattery the last time we were on this. But I wanted you to know how quickly he then changes with in verse 14 with a three-letter word. In verse 15, he starts then by connecting it by saying, but, even after he kind of gave them all of that, he says, but I have written you, blah, 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 blah. Which now tells me that he's following the pattern of the Lord. In John, the Gospel of John, it says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, which means God, through Christ, graced us first so we would feel and experience his love, but then he would also give us truth. Truth without grace sometimes can turn into legalism. Grace without truth is nothing more than religious sentimentality. So you put those two together. So what Paul did is he followed the Lord. He gave them grace. He graced them with some compliments. But he also was, said, that's not enough. I, but I've got to tell you something. And now he tells him something. Go, to, go further in verse 15. It says, but I have written you, and I love this, not boldly to you. He says, I've written very boldly to you. Now look up here for a second. I started my sermon by telling you that people have different personalities. I think he was a pretty dominant kid. He got out there and he, he, there were no flies on the Apostle Paul. So whether he spoke or whether he wrote, whether it was public or there was one-on-one, he was a bold dude. He would get out that message. So he says, but I have written you very boldly to you on some points, which reminds me that he didn't hammer everybody of every truth. So in other words, all the Bible doesn't have to be beat on somebody, but certain points you have to pause and say, get it? When I teach seminars at different places, I start the seminar by saying, when I say get it, you say got it, And I say good, all right? And that's a little way to make sure you're tracking. And that's what he's basically doing here. I give you some truth, very boldly. I wrote to you before. I want you to get it on some points. Then he says, why? Go on a little bit further. It's so cool. He says, to remind you again. Now, I'm so glad he wrote that. And he says that phrase often in his writings to his folks. Peter, the apostle, says the same thing often. I love that because some of you that think, Stan just repeats himself. Well, I'm in good company with Apostle Paul and Peter. You got that? And why did he do that? Because they are, you are, and I am filled with a propensity to forget things. In fact, someone told me that, Stan, do you know that people will forget 90% of what you said on Sunday 72 hours after you preach? Do you know what that does? You know, that just rips my heart out, you know, and that happens. And I think before they ever did statistics, The Holy Spirit told Paul, say it to him again. Tell him again. All right? Get it? Good. All right. Let's go on. So very bully said again. And now we're getting into the point. And so your first point is, if you want to serve the Lord God's way, we would respond to the grace God gives us to minister. We would respond to the grace God gives us to minister. Now, that that is such a big chunk of filet mignon, that phrase. But I don't want you to choke on it. I I don't want you to say that's just too much and go back to eating some pablum. I want you to grab this for a moment. That means that whatever God has called you to do. So let's just start out. If you're a guy, you're a guy. You're a girl, you're a girl. So you live in your identity that way by the grace of God. If God has called you to be single, then you minister, you serve. That's what the word minister means. I put minister in there, but I want you to know it's beyond just being a preacher and a reverend. It just means serving one another. You do it by God's grace. If you're a mom or your dad, you do it by God's grace. If you're a student, you're a student by God's grace. And if some of you are looking at opportunities in the church to serve, but you're saying, I don't know that I can do that, 
you can serve in that role by God's grace. So in other words, God's going to grace all of us to do what he wants us to do. And now we have to respond to that grace. Now, how do we respond to the grace? Well, first of all, we have to know what grace is. A lot of different definitions of grace, but grace in this context means this. Grace is the ability to do what God wants you to do for his glory, his way. All it is is a unique enablement from the Lord. I like to say it this way. God's, enable, God's commandments come with God's enablements. Whatever he has called you, wants you to do, you can do. You can tell the truth. You cannot lie. You can overcome those. You can overcome gossiping, whatever that might be. But you also can learn how to come alongside other people and add value to them in some measure. Whether it's actually teaching, preaching the word of God, speaking to them the word of God, or just helping, sweeping, cleaning, picking up, helping, serving, whatever it is, by the grace of God. Now that's the general term. Now let's see how it worked in Paul's life because that's great, but did it work with Paul? Let's go back to the passage. It's cool. He says, I remind you again, because of the grace that was given to me from God, so your grace is not something you work up, it's not something we deserve, it's not something we have to manufacture, God gives it to us, it's from God. Then he says, to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Let's just stop at the phrase, to be a minister of Jesus Christ. That means whatever you do, you are actually serving the Lord. So whether you're, you're presenting the gospel in the jungles of, um, uh, of the South Pacific, or whether you are serving in some simple job here of serving tables, I want you to know mentally you have to think, whatever I am doing, I am doing for the pleasure of one person, and that is God. I serve him. I serve Christ. But Paul says, for him, his main serving of Christ was in the area of the Gentiles. Yours might be to your neighbors. It might be in your workforce. It might be someone that's in your family. That's your little outlet for the grace of God to flow through you from Christ for his glory. Go back to the passage. All right, it goes on to say here, to the Gentiles ministering as a priest, the gospel of God, which is simply that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, by the glory of God alone, because the gospel is good news, the good news of Christ dying and rising again. So you're giving the message that God gave his son so that we can have eternal life. So he was a priest of that. So he says, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Spirit unto the Lord. And oh, that is so special when you talk about that. So let's explain what we're saying here. I know that's pretty deep. Let me come up for air. I'll explain this and then show it how it works in your life. When he says that um, I'm a priest, he's not talking about a priest with a backward collar. He's basically saying that I represent in a relational way, like a priest would, I am taking that which could be known of God and I'm bringing them to the people. And then like a priest would do, Old Testament is our illustration of the priest of the Old Testament, not of the Roman church. He says, I'm going to take the people now, and I'm going to bring them to God. So my job is to have God and them shake hands with one another and hug each other and to have that intimate relationship. I'm a priest doing that. It's all because of the gospel. I can do this kind of stuff because the grace that was given to me, hence I respond to that grace, therefore I was doing these things, because here's what I want to do. I want to take those people that I've been ministering to, that I've given my life for, and I want to present them to the Lord as best as I can, fully sanctified, separated unto the Lord, living a life of purpose and meaning. So my calling is not just to make sure they don't go to hell. I want to make sure that they have a fully devoted life following Christ, a holistic life inside and out for his glory. And that's what I want to do for the Lord. Now, that's in context. Now, how does that fit your life? So you're a daddy now. So as a daddy, God gave you the grace to be a dad. He will give you the grace to be a dad when you are a dad. And then when you get that grace, your purpose is I'm, I'm serving as dad to please the Lord. So how does a dad please the Lord as a dad? Because my ultimate desire is to have my sons have an, or, and daughters have an intimate relationship with God, whatever God calls them to do. So I want to present them to the Lord. So a sense, I want you to see the kids that you have, whether you purposely, I got to be real careful because this is going all over, but whether you, you plan to have a child or whether you want to define that child as an oops baby, it doesn't really matter because God wanted that baby to be born into your life or you to adopt that child out of the millions that needed to be adopted or fostered. You now have that child for the purpose of now helping that child grow to the Lord. And that's your calling. Now, that's one area. I don't want to fracture you and get you go you know, mind boggle with too much information. But if your whole life is given to the Lord, I serve him where I go, when I go, how I go, whatever, with whom I'm with, then your whole life has meaning. 
All of a sudden, you have an eternal perspective. All of a sudden, everything has real reason for what you're doing. Even when you go through the pits of life, I want you to know it's all purposeful. And that's what happened here. So if I want to serve the Lord the Lord's way, I have to believe this is grace. It's the power to do what God calls me to do. He's called me to do this, so he's given me the grace. It's not just to do it. It's so I could do it for him and to bring the people that I'm trying to reach back up to the Lord as well. That's what he really tried to do, and it's so important. But I need you to see something else that really kind of smacks me. Verse 16, he says, he goes on, to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become... And all may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Wow, how powerful can that really be? If you go into verse 18, he says, I will not presume this on myself. So what does that mean? So we're going to go to number two now. If you get the grace of God and you're responding to the grace of God through the word of God and the spirit of God for the people of God that you're trying to minister to, like your family, watch what happens. There will be a kickback of a sense of fulfillment and fruit I'll talk to that in a moment. When you're really in the rhythm, like baseball players would say, um, on the bat that you swing, you swing it a certain way. You don't have the label on the top or on the side where it could break. You, you hit the bat in the zone. When you're in the zone of what God's called you to do, you will have a sense of, whew, there's a fulfillment there. You know you're in that zone. But I also believe there's going to be some fruit. And fruit to me is just, you're going to start seeing some results. Because that's what God's grace does. It humbles us. He gives us the grace. He exalts us. So the exaltation, in other words, you get put up. You you see results. You see success. It's going to happen to you. That's the joy of serving the Lord. You you don't serve a heavy taskmaster who's going to show favoritism to others and give someone else something that you don't get. Just get your eyes off those other people and just keep your eyes on the Lord and he will reward you. And that's what's happening. But what then happens is it's very easy for us to get hoity-toity. A lot of preachers do that. It happens all around. They lose sight of the fact that they're shepherding of God's people. They think they're great pulpiteers, especially if they have radio, TV, and they're writers and authors, and their crowds are so huge, all they see is a blur of humanity when they're up there, and a few people that are on their staff, and a few more that's maybe on their boards, and pretty soon, because they're doing so well, and you can't tell them anything different because they got it right, look at the crowds, they then can live by themselves, and that's where they get into trouble. And God reminds us the importance of humility. Now, pause for a moment. If anybody could have exploded into pride, it would have had to have been the Apostle Paul. I mean, think about it. Think about who trained him, the Lord, when he was away. Think about the miracles and things that he has done. Think about the person who was brought up to the third heaven. Think about the guy who wrote the majority, or almost the majority, of the New Testament by the Spirit of God. Think about a guy who could have had pride. This guy could have had pride. I don't know if he had a wife around. That that kind of helps your pride thing. I I will say that, all right? And so I thank the Lord for the fourth person of the Trinity, my sweet wife. All right, but anyway, um, it can work in that. But here, he could have had pride. But notice what a servant had. So I want to, real quickly, here's what a servant had. When, when, When a true servant who is humble before the Lord, they're the kind of people that they take no credit for themselves. Look at that verse again. I will not presume to speak anything except what Christ accomplished through me. Whatever happened is because what the Lord did. Dads, moms, whatever job you might have, your kids, your family, whatever good you're getting from this, it's because the Lord did all of that. So back off and say, Lord, look what you've done. And the more praise you give to the Lord, the more God's going to open up doors for you to use that praise for him because it's all about him. And that's just what he's saying here. It goes on a little bit further. He's also filled with integrity. The, the verse says this. He says, resulting in, excuse me, what you have done, that's for, for Christ, has accomplished through me. In other words, he's only speaking what the Lord wanted him to speak. That's integrity. He's doing it to give glory to the Lord, what you, Lord, accomplished through me. Then he said, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed. So in other words, whatever results that Paul had, which were now many Gentiles getting saved by their word and deed, not by their word, but you'd see it through their word and deed that they were trusting Christ, etc. All right, it's because of what the Lord did. So now let's say that, um, well, let me ask you this. I know this is not a tangent, but maybe it is. I hope not. Have you ever seen these bumper stickers that says, my kid is an honor student at such and such school? You know, how many says my kid was a dropout? You never see that. It's always my kid was an honor student, you know. I get all of that. And, and it's, it's how many people will flash to me on Facebook their kids and where they're at and what they're doing and they're here and they're speaking there and they got a chance to get to this level and blah, 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 blah. I know there's a degree of um, excitement 
And Paul was not one to put it down. He said, the Gentiles are obedient. They're indeed in word. That's kind of a bragamony. But he was very quick then to say that it all came from the Lord. And so should you get out there and have an opportunity to say, and this is my son whom I'm well pleased, just remember that son started in the mind of God before that son was in your, your, your wife's womb and other things. All right, so that point still being is God gets all the glory. So don't run away from that. Enjoy it, but make sure it teflons off of you onto them. Now, let's go a little bit further because... When you're working as a servant of the Lord, whatever your job is, whatever your career field might be, or a parent, it says here, this is beautiful. He says, he did all of this in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit. So I believe whatever he did, he had power, like you have power. That power then revealed itself in signs and wonders, Then it says, the results were so well known that it went from Jerusalem and around about and as far as, and it kept on going, and I'm going to open that up on another point. But for right now, I just want you to know that because he responded to the grace, he had the right motive, he was humble, he then wrapped these people up and brought them to Christ, he gave God the glory, he celebrated the good that they did because of what the Lord did, and he had all these signs and wonders that God did, he gave the glory to the Lord. Get it? Good. Now, I am going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. Ooh, I noticed they didn't put my clock up on the wall since they took down the Christmas decorations. Bless whoever didn't put it up. All right, let's go on. <clears throat> I need to talk about signs and wonders. My problem is I only have like a couple minutes to do this, and this is a very provocative subject in so-called Christianity today. So I want you to know that I have my softest gloves on I have my 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 tongue is dipped in honey as I speak as much as I can but I must speak boldly on the truth of tongue uh, of, of signs and wonders etc so to do that I'm going to rattle through some of my notes that's an abbreviated fashion you do not have these notes they'll be abbreviated On the other hand, I will provide all of you a paper that I have done on the whole issues of signs and wonders, and it'll be abbreviated enough so that you can understand it at whatever level, and it's well documented with a lot of footnotes, and all you have to do is to send me $100, and I'll be glad to get that to you. No, no, it's just free. Just email it. You know, it's my email somewhere on your, your form there. Just send it to me, and I will give you that, but I do want you to listen to this because I have to speak to it. The big question is, as Paul did signs and wonders, what about today? Do I have to have signs and wonders in order to have the results that he had in the things that God has called me to do? In other words, do I have to do something spectacular in order for my daughter to walk with God? Yeah, you do. You just have to live a faithful, dependable, humble, gracious, biblical Christian life. And by the way, that to me is a miracle. And it takes supernatural power and God gives it to us. So let me just kind of rattle through this pretty quickly. You can just listen. First, I need to find for you what signs and wonders are. Signs and wonders and miracles are events performed by God through human agents so extraordinary they cannot be explained by natural forces. I know you couldn't write all that down by the tape. Okay, let's go on. The next question is about signs and wonders. Just a general overview. Here they are. Signs and wonders were performed in the Old Testament. Particularly, you can start seeing it most dramatically in Exodus chapter 7. If you recall when Moses was there in front of Pharaoh and all these things were happening, you know all that. And so there's a lot of signs and wonders there. Signs and wonders can be duplicated by Satan and those involved in the occult. Those are two separate statements. That signs and wonders that God did in the Old Testament and in the future, we'll see that in a moment, can also be duplicated by Satan and even those involved in the occult because those in the occult are connected to Satan. It can be done. If you go back to Exodus chapter 7 again, when you see all these things that are done by Moses, you will see that even the ones that were done by the magicians could be matched. Not all of them, but some of them. When you get into the New Testament, you're going to find that even Paul alludes to the fact that there were people that could do things that were equal to what the Christians were doing as signs and wonders, but were not of signs and wonders. Now, you've got to hear this next phrase. So you don't think that they're both competing, Satan and his power and his signs and wonders and gods. And we'll figure out later on, like spy versus spy in the old mad magazine, who wins at the end. No, no, God is on the throne. So number three is this. Signs and wonders of God are superior to signs and wonders. Remember, Moses threw the rod down. The rod came back, turning the snake, came back as a rod. Magicians threw the rod down, turned into a snake, and then they ran. 
Okay, because it didn't fit, because God's far more superior. Number four, signs and wonders were performed in the New Testament by Jesus Christ in Acts 2, by Stephen in Acts 6. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.